I'd like to welcome Matt Weiss to the podium, who is going to um, introduce and moderate our next panel. Thanks, Matt. Hopefully I'm just introducing and not moderating. Uh, if I am moderating, I am ill-prepared. Apologies. Um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to come before you and, and speak today. And, I, and Gary, thank you, if you're still in the room. Um, you know, my father once told me when I was a child being driven around the, uh, the back roads of rural Wisconsin, he said, son, pointing to a, a nearby field, uh, do you know why farmers switched to using round bales of hay from the rectangular ones that we have on our farm? So, you know, I asked, why, Dad? I was anticipating he would come back with some type of incredible response that would, like, blow my mind, astound me, maybe, you know, think about our place, make me question our place in the universe and humanity. Uh, and instead, he excitingly replied, because they found out that cows weren't getting a square meal. <laughs> you know, so I, I never forgot that day, or my dad's truly awful joke. Uh, but, but seeing as how I grew up in on a dairy farm in Wisconsin and being told jokes about bales of hay, it is likely no surprise to any of you uh, that I, my first job was detasseling corn. Uh, if you don't know what that is, please Google it. That's why Google was invented. I'm not going to explain it. It involves removing a tassel from a corn stalk. Um, myself, along with the rest of my 13-year-old counterparts, you know, relished the idea that we would be able to spend the bulk of our summer outside without parental supervision, making a whopping $3.25 an hour marching along cornfields. The work was hard, very hard in fact. Um, harder than growing up on a dairy farm, which seems odd. Many days it involved us moving around and showing up at a high school at 6.30 in the morning to take a bus out to a cornfield. One day, we got to the field and there was a group of older women there which was very unusual. Uh, we were surprised, but they worked alongside of us, and us being 13-year-old kids, we really didn't think much of it or care. Um, it turns out that these women were refugees from Vietnam that were working as migrant workers. Um, you know, as, as I look back on that time, uh, at the end of that summer, I made about $300 for my efforts in that field all summer long. Uh, I went and spent it all at the mall on video games immediately like the next day. I had my parents drive me to the mall and they had numerous protests, but there it was. Uh, I only later came to realize the inequities of that situation, the privilege that I had been given, knowing that these women had to take what essentially was the same amount of money that I had been given for video game money and spend that on food and bills and living. My experience that summer helped me shape and inform my understanding of the challenges that many marginalized job seekers must endure to meet the most basic of needs. So at my organization, National Label Network, our, our core work is twofold. We connect older workers and other job seekers to training and to family sustaining employment while simultaneously ensuring that we're working to develop demand-focused employment strategies that ensure people are prepared for jobs and employers are prepared for people. Makes sense. Four years ago, we had begun our equity journey by viewing our strategic planning process through an equity lens. So as you can imagine, and I'm sure many of you have gone through this, this led to very difficult questions being asked about our policies, our procedures, and even how we operationalize our mission within the communities that we serve. The work culminated in the review of internal and external policies, processes, and other areas that we found unknowingly inhibited participant access to service. Now, this was not our intention by any means, but we had become part of the bureaucracy and the processes that we had grown overly accustomed to serving. There's power in access. And while we were able to root out the barriers that we had unknowingly created, this is far too familiar scenario that we know we all know here disproportionately impacts older workers of color across nearly all aspects of the employment continuum. We need to be intentional about advocating for equity. 
After discovering a gap in how job seekers were being prepared for employment within the IT industry, we felt compelled to create our own vocational IT training program. This not only focuses on creating a sustainable pipeline of IT talent in the IT workforce, uh, but we focused on serving underserved populations to make IT look less like me and more like what it should. We served thousands of people in this program over the past decade. And this initiative has recently led to the elimination of a bachelor's degree requirement for apprentices in our program as they enter entry-level IT roles with one of the largest IT employers in the world. Now, why that was a requirement to begin with was beyond me. But we showed them that it's possible to achieve good workforce outcomes and make good hires without it. The payoff has ensured access, at least with this employer, is open to everyone. True sustainability and correcting the structures that have led to the employment inequities we see today require a concerted effort to ensure equitable access of resources, supports, services, while at the same time making the economic case for changes in hiring practices to dismantle the systems of subtle in and intentional ageism and discrimination that exist everywhere in our workforce. We've grappled with these tough questions as an organization. We've questioned our identity. It's hard, but the stories are what's important. There is power in access, and facilitating access is critical. I don't know that anyone has it all figured out. I know I don't, right? Um, but I feel like asking the question of what's next is a step in the right direction. What's next for us as an organization? What's next for this group? What's next in the workforce? I feel like the work that we are doing here today is critical, but it gives me incredible hope and optimism that we are set up for the future. With that, I am very excited to introduce our next session, uh, where our panelists will explore strategies for increasing equitable access to economic opportunity. I'll introduce them here. Uh, I'd like to invite our speakers up to the stage. So our moderator, who we, we all know very well, uh, broadcast journalist and the host of The Daily Drama on WHURFM, Harold T. Fisher. Uh, Clayton Fong, President and CEO of the National Asian, Asian Pacific Center on Aging. Come on up. Larry Curley, Executive Director for the uh, National Indian Council on Aging. Come on up. Luis Quiones, Deputy Vice President of Workforce Development and Adult Education at Unitas U.S. And of course, Tracy Scott, the Vice President of Workforce Development for the National Urban League. Thank you again. Oh, oh. I'm back. <laughs> uh, this panel uh, is a tough one actually. Uh, it's tough because older workers of color want to do just that. They want to work. But they face a lot of unique challenges, discrimination, limited access to education, training bias, and other systemic barriers. So we're going to look at increasing access to education and training and how best to address discrimination in the workplace. I want to start with Tracy, if I might. Uh, please paint a picture for us about the struggles that older workers of color are up against as they try to re-enter the workforce. Thank you for that question. Sure. Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. It's so nice to address uh, each of you on this really important topic. Uh, so there are four items that I'd like to talk about with you here on just generalized challenges that older workers of color's face as they're seeking employment and as they seek to remain employed. Uh, so one, I would mention the fact that 
older workers of color tend to have jobs that are more technician and those jobs that are frontline, which are often those jobs that require a lot more physical labor. So an example of in the healthcare field, um, workers of color often are like your CNAs, your certified nurses assistants, or registered nurses, which is much more physically demanding, as opposed to being um, a pharmacist or a surgeon, which is less physically demanding. Uh, if you look at that for in construction, which is overwhelmingly represented among our communities, that is physically demanding labor, which means it puts a lot more stress on one's body. But it also can include jobs such as service worker, service workers which do not provide adequate health care. So what we have when we have what we have with individuals in the workplace who are older are that they're in poorer health than other, that those who are the standard bearer of it. And that creates its own issue because it usually means they need to retire much sooner than their other um, counterparts in the workforce itself. It also may mean that they don't have as much saved up because of the pay, the pay wage gap that's there. And so they find themselves needing to actually stay in the workplace longer or they are actually forced out prematurely, which then creates other issues itself. I will also mention that while a lot of the jobs that they're had, they used to be union-backed jobs, but we've seen a decline in union-backed jobs, which meant that um, investments in organized labor, meaning pensions and other forms of retirement savings, don't exist, nor do they have enough resources to contribute to the open market or have enough time to do so. And so for that, they're really caught in a catch-22 between I need, they need to prioritize their particular health, but at the same time, they don't really have any of the resources that many others might have in order to cover it. So that's one. The second one I would love to talk about, and I'm so glad we were mentioning it earlier with Lowe's, of returning citizens. We do not talk enough, and I love what uh, Brent Parton was saying a little bit earlier about workforce development often looks in the middle of the road, the most obvious folks, and we do not think about sort of on the bell curve, the outskirts of the bell curve. Older workers, when uh, older, I'm sorry, older returning citizen workers, they often remain unemployed because the first thing they need to do is attend to their health because they age faster while they are incarcerated because health care and access to decent health care isn't what it would be if they were not incarcerated. And so for them, that's their first thing they need to attend. But on a condition of their parole, they have to find job and have to find housing. And so it becomes a little bit of a problem. If I need to attend to any element of my health care, that's in contradiction with me finding work. And so that becomes a problem in addition to racial or ageism in the workplace. Uh, the third thing, sorry, I told you I was going to give you a sermon, but I'm trying my best not to. <laughs> the third thing I want to bring up, which um, it may not often be talked about, is what's called the black tax. This is a term that originated in South Africa, but it really applies to all communities of color. That when you have an individual has gotten out of the poverty trap, so to speak, they feel an obligation, whether it's cultural or they, it's just familial, to then take care of their family who have not gotten out of it. So a wonderful example of a grandmother or grandparents who paid into a pension program, they mapped out what the retirement was going to be until they're 80, 90 years old, but it might be uh, their child might have fallen sick and is no longer take care of their own, themselves or their own children, so they're back in the home, which means that's more of their income that they had budgeted did not account for an additional family member that's there. It could be somebody who's been incarcerated. They might be commissary, so they have to take money out of their budget to help that family member. Either way, it's money hitting their retirement that they can't necessarily afford in order to do that. And when you consider that the majority of communities of color are led by women, uh, um, women of the leader of the household for a number of reasons. They might be widowed, they might be for other reason itself. Um, it also means that also, uh, uh, also drained for women in that way of being caretakers, sandwich generation itself, but then also because of the work which we had mentioned beforehand. And then the final bit, and I'll shut up, is on uh, digital literacy. We had mentioned that here on the stage earlier today that older workers are just are not as literate. And um, there's wonderful, great successes we've had in our own. So the National Urban League operates a CSEP program. It is our oldest and longest workforce development program. For over 50 years, we've been running it. And we've seen such changes and great successes when we have added digital literacy in tandem with workforce development training. Louise, I want to talk to you about education and training. There are 
many older workers who are trying to re-enter the workforce. They know they need to be re-educated. They know they need training. But how do they know, number one, what to do or what training to seek? and whether or not that training will sustain them for their second or, in this case, perhaps even third act? Um, so thank you for the question. I will say, in our experience in Unidos US, right, we have an affiliate network of 297 affiliates. And basically, I always say that we do not use our affiliate resources enough, right? Um, we need trusted institutions in which people that have the culturally and the linguistically relevance to serve our community. Now, how do they, um, so oftentimes, a, a, our community, Latinos, um, that's, I'm gonna focus on, 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 my, on my folks, um, we tend to um, engage with those trusted institutions, right? And those community-based organizations are like oftentimes the first place where you go so you can get the career coaching, so you can get like the guidance, right? And so I will say um, utilizing the, the power of community-based organizations. Um, two, in terms of like, there's a lot out there, right? And oftentimes uh, our community can fall prey of these courses that cost a lot of money and ultimate are not going to lead you anywhere, right? Currently, there's a lot around the digital badges. That has been a hot topic, and everybody wants a digital badge. The thing with the digital badge is, if the badge doesn't have currency with the employer, if it's not recognized by the employer, ultimate is nothing, right? And so you're, you're oftentimes individuals, um, older workers, are going after this um, flashy things, but you have to ensure that you're going by um, the advice of professionals. Now, the other piece that, I, that I'll say in terms of um, trainings, it's great when you can have incumbent, incumbent worker trainings, right, that allow, Tracy was mentioning, like, a lot of our folks are working in low-wage jobs, right? We have one of our partners, um, Building Skills um, Partnerships in, in California, where they have a partnership. They are working with the janitorial staff, right? Um, uh, the custodial staff, and they're working while they are on the clock and they're providing digital skills in ESL language, right? Which is huge in our community. Um, and so then these individuals now have the opportunity to either move up or move to other jobs that are not, that are higher um, paying um, jobs. And so when you look at like what models work, I would say a few things. Nonprofits uh, and two, really pushing employers to have this sort of partnership um, to train their incumbent workers. Clayton. When your constituents are reaching out to your organization about the problems that they're having trying to get back into the workforce, what are they telling you? What are the biggest problems? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. Let me start by trying to address what I would call the myth. You know, oftentimes Asian Americans are thought of as Westinghouse science winners and the mm -hmm. graduates of mm -hmm. Ivy League schools, but does that ever belie the truth in the population? Yes, there are some high-profile success stories, and my, people like my parents could be more proud of that. But they came here and sacrificed tremendously just for that minuscule opportunity, because for every single Westinghouse science winner, there's a lot of folks who don't get there. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of focus on who, this, who the population we choose to focus on is. And I, I'll tell it on a personal basis. My mom was 14 years old when the Japanese occupation of China was there. She lived under a wood pile for almost a month, and her four-year-old sister brought a meal once a day to her, because had she not lived under that wood pile, she probably would have been raped and abducted by the Japanese soldiers. Fast forward, that family escapes to Hong Kong during the, um, and one by one, earns the money to bring folks to America. What was that all about? 
it wasn't about them. It was about me. It was about the opportunities that that, that generation would have. But then what does that mean? What, what do the sacrifices mean from, from that? My mom worked in an almond factory, for starters. Pretty menial job, pretty tough. She really moved up when she figured out how to become a hairdresser. All those are pretty working class jobs. But guess what? When the time came to retire, her Social Security check was $400 a month. How do you live on that? Even though she was here for so long. So that's the context I want to put this in first. For many immigrant families, and in our community, 70% of Asian Pacific elders, and I use the word elders, not over work, older workers, because I think it's respectful. For Asian Pacific elders, 70% don't speak English well. Speak other than English, excuse me, speak other than English at home. 50% don't speak English well. And 30% have no adult in the household who speaks English. So what's the gap? I call myself on the Hill the language nag because I just say, no, it's about language. It's about that. That is such a tremendous structural impediment to access to services, to access to the economy, to access to whatever. And you know, in the end, they learned their English, but you know, their first language was, um, was, um, was Chinese. And I often would say to folks, you know, what do you do your, if you're gonna add something up, what do you do your math in? And I'll go to elders and they'll say, well, I do my math in Chinese and I translate the result to English. You know what that means? You think, you think in Chinese because that's what you grew up doing. But when you get older, when you get older and you're in an assisted living facility or you know, just really having a hard time making certain choices, your first choice to make hard decisions is gonna be to get that in language. And so I, I frame that up merely to say, that's why the language barrier is so darn important. We've got to, so, so we, we emphasize, and when we run our CSEP program, 95% of those elders don't speak English, hardly at all. Actually, 95% of them don't have an email address. Pretty hard. And then what we do is we assign them an email address, and 50% of them don't check it more than once, don't even check it once a week. So what does that mean? They're pretty digitally isolated. In this economy, Here's the beauty of the economy. We've actually gotten better for most of society with the efficiencies of the digital age, but we've taken limited English-speaking elders and made them even more marginalized with that digital divide. And so, yes, um, I, I gotta, I'm not, maybe not answering the question, rambling a little bit, but it's just, that's the care and that's what we worry about. I was so happy to see uh, Brent, the Acting Assistant Secretary, talk about focusing on those of greatest need. Because sometimes our worker programs have been so focused on outcomes that we forget the folks who need it the most. Because what happens is, if you have that language barrier and that digital divide, you're gonna be hard pressed. You're gonna sandbag that guy's numbers. And so they might not want them. So what often happens for elders and elders of color is the regular workforce programs would rather not serve them. They don't do it intentionally, but subtly because that's gonna sandbag their, their, their numbers. Now, that's not a popular thing to always say, but those of us who are in that area know it. How often do you get the referral? You know, a, a Korean elder comes into a, a WIA or whatever, and they get referred to us. Now, it, they should, because we can, we can speak the language. But the flip side is, that's what we're trying to get at. So if, the, if your question is, what are they asking for? The first and foremost thing is they're just asking for some basic access basic information, not anything special, just access to the same things. And if language and digital is a barrier, we've got to figure out how to overcome that barrier for them. Larry, talk to us about some of the hyper-specific issues that, that older native workers are encountering as they try to re-enter the workforce. I think one of the things that I think about initially, right from the very beginning, is that American Indians who are members of federally recognized tribes are members of a distinct political sovereign body. And so that, that's the beginning point. There's been discussions many times where I've heard BIPOC. Yes. And we in Indian country, we're not BIPOC. We are members of a sovereign nation and we have the tribes have their own laws, have their own regulations, and they have their own culture. 
I think that part of Indian country in the 40 years that I've worked in Indian country has been what is the most important thing about Indian tribes? Work included, health related, education, every one of those issues. Where does it point to? It points to the survival of Indian tribes in this country. Because every day, every day, we talk about attacks on Indian tribes, their sovereignty, limiting their sovereignty, and the traditions, the culture, the language. All of those is what makes Indian people Indians, that makes them unique. Interpret it. Because that's what English sounded to me when I first started in grade school. In grade school, from the very beginning, they said, when I went to work for an area agency on aging, one of the people there asked me a question. The elderly advisory council asked me, you minority people talk about only minority people can understand the needs of minority people. You're a member of a minority group, and now you're working with a larger society. How do you know our problems? And I said, Catherine, that was her name. When I came to school, the larger society said, you know, you need to learn how to speak English. You need to speak our language. You also need, before you even refer that further, you need to know what we believe. Mm. He said, it's in that little black book. <clears throat> I said, oh, okay. So I learned Genesis, Revelations, Old Testament, New Testament, Romans 3.16, all of those. I learned that. I said, okay, here I am. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to learn how to dress like us. Here I am. And he said, oh, that's not enough, Larry. That's not enough. You've got to value the things that we value. He said, you need a three-bedroom home, a Volvo in the front yard, and you need a sweet white picket fence, color TV. That's what you need to desire. I said, okay, fine, I'll do that. Oh, but not before that, Larry, before you do that. Before you were one of us, you know that little piece of cloth up there on that metal post? You've got to know what that means. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Now I got it. And I said, Catherine, what do you know about Indian tribes? She said, very little. And I think that that's a summation of what we in Indian country are trying to do, whether it be employment of older Indians into the field, education of Indian, young pe Indian people into the field. When you have an education dropout rate in Indian country of about 29%, we have a problem because I'm not satisfied with where we are now, but I want to look 20, 30 years down the line. Because I think I'm tired of looking at the here and now is we need to start looking upstream and coming up with solutions to the whole issue of unemployment, poverty in this country. And we talk about equity. And so for me, that has been my lifetime goal the survival of Indian tribes in this country. 574 federally recognized tribes in this United States. When I went to work in the field of aging in the early 70s, there were 83,000 older Indians aged 60 and over. Today, 503,000 older Indians in this country. But a lot of that growth is because federal tribes, back then there were 300 some tribes, Federally recognized today to 574. 
That population has grown just because the federal government said, we're going to recognize you as an Indian tribe. We always knew we were Indians. What's really interesting sometimes is somebody asked me one time, why don't you go back to where you came from? Mm. <laughs> I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I do want to talk about a very, a very heavy lift question, uh, DEI and discrimination. We know that in some areas uh, of the country right now, when you mention DEI, you're going to get the eye roll. Mm -hmm. And in this current political climate in America, uh, this is not a welcoming conversation. And certainly it can be argued, and this was mentioned in one of the earlier conversations, that the recent Supreme Court decisions about affirmative action could prompt not just a legal trickle down, but a continued shift in anti-DEI attitudes in the corporate world. So I, I want to hear from each of you briefly about strategies to, to push back against discrimination for older workers of color. And I'll start with you, Tracy. Please go. No, no, don't start with me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, that, so I don't know, there, it, I, there's a lot of ways that I can approach this question, answering one, it. No, I'm nugget. gonna give it to you, don't yeah, worry, we're good. Nugget. So uh, one of them is the whole concept of, uh, today we have weaponized and put way too much value on victims and victimization. That everybody wants to see themselves as a victim because in previous times we saw that there were resources running to people who are marginalized. And so all of a sudden they see, mar as we see, you know, resources moving across different communities, across different parts of the country, all of a sudden everybody says, well, where's my piece? And that gets in the way. It has completely diluted the whole media of DEIA. It has diluted the ability to have, you know, sort of peer-to-peer -peer conversations about it because the whole concept is that, that power and money are attached to it. When really the whole conversation of DEIA is just daggone access. Why, should we, why are we arguing with people who want to have access to jobs? Why is that a political issue? But we've gotten caught up in this sort of soundbite conversation. So, but so it, what's, what, what is the strategy to try to adjust this? Because we, we know the problem. Yeah. But how, how do we particularly, again, in this political climate, how do we push back on it? Um, how do we do it overtly? Is it subtle? Is it? The reason why I'm saying is that I can, put, I can put any particular idea in front of you. So for example, it used to be, let's have DEIA training. Well, then that became politicized. Mm -hmm. Then it could be, well, why don't we have affinity groups? But then that became marginalized in the issues. So the whole point is, is that there's always going to be a battle about it. I think there is. So that's where I'm a little bit struggling on what there is no panacea for this issue as long as race will always be a politicized discussion, as long as accessibility will always be a politicized issue itself. I will say that both Luis and I participate in, um, in an, an alliance called the Rework America Alliance, which is intentional about changing what the workforce development ecosystem can look like. So it can include how do you train hiring managers so that one, your um, job postings are not um, sort of have implicit or explicit biases in them. Um, how do you make sure the questions that you ask do not reflect implicit or explicit biases that are included in them? It also can include training for your career counselors, so ensuring that as they are counseling someone, you're not implicit or explicitly diverting them for what we call the results of occupational segregation. That is really something revolutionary we haven't done because we're, it's literally when we're saying changing the ecosystem, it can include policy, it can include practices with hiring managers, it include workforce development, or I'm sorry, um, uh, what the, the one stops, the unemployment offices and how you do. So yes, we can, but it is new and we're trying to move that. I mm -hmm. wanted to see if you wanted to add anything on Rework America. Well, and the reason, and the reason mm -hmm. why I, well, the reason why I asked is because mm -hmm. the expectation from this panel is that the four of you will save the world by the end of today. <laughs> uh, so, but before I, before I go, uh, yeah. uh, but before I go to Luis, I, I yeah. wanted to hear what Clayton had to sure. say about, about this issue. Let me 
make two points on that. First, I will try to focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. And I think the notion that, you know, I, we, we, there is absolutely no doubt, particularly those that um, are of an older generation. Think about how hard things were for those that were working in the 50s and the 60s versus now. Now, that's not to say that we have a long ways to go, but think about that. So what usually we will do is focus on no one will argue the point, or almost no one will argue the point, of what tremendous barriers and obstacles our older generation overcame if you're a person of color. Just, I won't even go further than that. But the second one I will say is the National Asian Pacific Center on Aging. When you talk to older adults, they don't really adopt the Asian notion. They actually, I'm Chinese, I'm Japanese, I'm Korean, I'm, and so, and in those countries, we have our own conflicts, right? So we are DEI by definition because we're trying to figure out how to keep 20 or 30 diverse groups and cultures and languages and dialects and somehow cobble that together and find a unified cause that we can all get behind and mobilize behind and be empowered for. And usually our elders is the number one. That's the one thing that binds us all. Larry, uh, briefly, your, your thoughts about strategies. And, and I think you really kind of touched on it in your first sharing in this conversation about cultural education. And I think that is just so, so important. But I think more broadly, how do you develop a strategy or have you and your constituencies develop a strategy to, to address this kind of issue? Well, I think, first of all, you know, just a little correction. Um, up till about two weeks ago, I was the executive director of the National Indian Council on Aging. And so now I am one of those unemployed elderly people, so. But. But you still, but, <laughs> but, to, that, but to your point, the, the title is less important than you still have people who listen to you, which is why you're here. And, and, and we appreciate that, and so do, Thank do you. Not, you know, do not belittle that at all, please. And I think that you said at the beginning, we are here to change the world. I believe that. At the age of 25 years old, I wrote a piece of legislation, drafted an amendment to the Older Americans Act called Title VI of the Older Americans Act. I thought it was nothing back then. Today, I look back on that piece of legislation. There are 273 grantees out there receiving all the $80 million of funding. They developed their senior center. They have their Meals on Wheels program. They have their nutrition programs. I look back on it now, and I think, holy cow, it did change. It just took one individual, and that's the one individual who is going to be the stalwart and standing there and fighting on behalf. It doesn't matter what it takes, but it does take that opportunity. For example, you're talking about legislation. You can do that through the legislative process. We change laws in, New in Nevada uh, to ensure that there's an Indian consultation policy with the Department of Health. We can do that. We created the 13th Area Office of the Indian Health Service, which had not been done in 50 years. It can be done. And I think that there are different pieces of legislation, like right now, for example, there's a public law 115477 that enables Indian tribes to consolidate all their labor programs, education, training, all of that at the, at the tribal level. Why not take that same model and apply it in the senior programs where you apply all of those components together to have an, include an intergenerational mentorship program? You talk about how that can be done. In Indian country, the, what we're trying to do is fight for the survival of Indian tribes. For example, to be a medicine man in Indian country and in, among the Navajo people, it takes 10 years of training. That's equivalent to a doctor. Why not take the senior CSEP program, train, young people, intergenerational, intergenerational, to train young people to be medicine men. 
And that way you preserve the culture. You preserve the tradition and the language. That's one way. But what's really interesting on that is that when I was working as a nursing home administrator, I, I had a nursing home where a person that passed away. And the tradition in that tribe was three days that person's still alive. They're still occupying the bed. But according to the Medicaid program, they said, no, that person's gone. I had to fight. I said for our theologians, a physician, a doctor, they would define death in one particular way. Why is our definition less valuable than your definition? It took a year before the state said, okay, we'll give you the full per diem rate. And he said, you know, because you guys messed around for a year, I'm going to go back to the time when the nursing home opened. I'm going to charge you guys $697,000 later. But you've got to fight for that particular belief. But they did reimburse me for all of those times that they didn't pay us. Uh, Louise, strategies for pushback against older workers of color. Um, so, a lot, let's see. So a big part of it is we are now, like Tracy said, we're now part of this Rework America Alliance and trying to create a skills economy, right? And what does that really mean? Um, it's really working at all the levels, at the C level, for them to understand what a skills economy is, but also at the front level, higher manager, uh, the person who is making those like first interviews to understand what practice, inclusive practices are. Right. So there's a lot of training and education that needs to happen. Right. Um, the other piece is sector-based partnerships. We cannot do this work together. Right. Like we have to join hands. Um, the other piece is, of course, um, policy. Right. Um, making policy recommendations. Another area that I will also say is around data, right? The power of data. We are not um, utilizing our data in the ways that we should. Um, and let's see, and I will say the, the, the other part that I'll mention has to do with when you have a skills economy, right? Like through experience, through um, formal education, you acquire those skills, but you don't have an ability to have portability of those credentials to go to one employer, to another employer, to another employer. Right? It's not recognized. And so we're really thinking through um, how can we leverage technology, right, where we could. Okay, let's see. All right. So this idea of, um, some folks call it um, LERs, right? Like learning, uh, learning experience uh, um, records. And so this is intended to be like, like an app, for lack of a better word, right? Where you, as you are working in different positions, you are acquiring this experience, right? And then, no matter what employer you are, you can go to this employer and they can validate, oh, yeah, these are, I feel like we need to move more on that, um, on that way, and they are pioneers in this, um, I would say in, in this field, that are investing dollars in creating this skills economy. So I would say those are some strategies. <clears throat> About two weeks ago, and I think some of you in this room probably saw it, members of the panel, you may have seen it. Uh, British-Canadian computer scientist, Geoffrey Hinton, he was known as the godfather of AI, was interviewed on 60 Minutes. And he said, quote, the risks are having a whole class of people who are unemployed and not valued much because what they used to do will now be done by machines. And there's another th phrase that I'm sure a lot of people are probably familiar with. My mother used to say it, stay ready so you don't have to get ready. But I don't think that phrase took into account AI and chat GPT. Mm -hmm. 
that's a whole, as they say on the street, that's a whole nother level. How do you stay ready so you don't have to get ready when faced with the promise and the risks of AI choices? You always start with me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that concept of, you know, uh, uh, stay ready, right? Um, so one of the things I think that we don't give enough credit to older workers is that they do want to learn new skills and that they do, they do want to be contributing members to their community. I think the thing we need to do, and this is where we talked about earlier on digital literacy, is just getting to feel more comfortable and confident in utilizing that. So I loved it a little bit just dovetailing, Luis, what you're talking about is how do we transform the workforce community so that it's skills-based? so that it's knowledge, it's based on knowledge itself. AI can only do so much. AI can't always do everything. And older workers who have that experience can synthesize and make connections that a computer, that a, that a computer just simply cannot do. So I think we really need to rethink how we can utilize, it's not just about can you do the work faster, can you do it better, but can you bring value to the work itself? And I know that older workers will appreciate that type of work because we know a mind in motion stays in motion. I think that it just really devalues if we just say, okay, that's enough, that's great, we're going to give you a simple job that's not physically meaningful, uh, and we're just gonna put you in a corner. So I would say, yes, we can, I think they can, I think they're willing to do it, we just need to find find a way, and I think we can certainly do that, uh, finding ways to keep them engaged. Larry. I guess one of the things I think about when we talk about AI is um, how can it be useful? And what are some of the dangers, and especially in some terms of Indian country? There was a book that came out by a guy by the name of John Nesmith back in the 70s called Megatrends. In that, he coined a concept called high-tech, high-touch. And I think that, that that's a part of AI that really comes into play. Because if you can balance the AI possibilities, for example, you can use it to preserve your culture, your tradition, your language, all of that. You can do it using that particular technology. On the other hand, it could also be misused in terms of, for example, recently when I was talking with a friend of mine who was in New York, they saw an advertisement in the New York Times for this non-Indian who had been out to the Navajo Nation, who had sat in on the, on the Blessing Way ceremony and had taped it, and now using that and selling Blessing Way ceremonies for $10,000 a pop. And so that's the potential misuse of how AI could be used to basically the de devalue or de the, the traditions and culture of Indian country. But I think, in my view, that it's not something to be feared. I think it needs to be navigated and look at both sides, the pros and the cons, and see how we neutralize the negative sides of it. Clayton, your thoughts about it? Um, opportunities and challenges. It's a balancing act, isn't it? Um, opportunity. Um, I was just talking to a congresswoman who was looking at a virtual health bill in Ways and Means, and we talked about how that could be applied to language access. Because you know, Cambodian and Burmese are kind of rare languages, so how do you reach out? Well, maybe, maybe technology can help do that. Now, the flip side of that, though, is as someone who uses technology, um, to be honest with you, the computer-aided translation is not very good. And if you want a giant liability, try practicing medicine with computer-aided um, <laughs> technology. Yeah. So it still requires people behind it. So our people use this, use this technology to cut the first draft, but the human being needs to look at it and say, okay, we got to double check this, because what happens, it makes efficient more, some processes, but it also makes more, more efficient mistakes. So that's challenge and, 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 and opportunity. Um, but on the workforce side, I, I worry about it. I, um, you know, our, I'm pretty, I, I am happy to profess that I'm not very digitally good at stuff. <laughs> um, we have, what we have tried to do is take incremental bites of it, though. So within our CSEP program, we just started a, a new training program that we, we actually went to Google, and Google said, hey, we'd like to try something um, on, on, with older workers. And uh, this is what we did. We said, you know, usually you got to get, learn English before we learn you, we teach you your computer skills. 
And I said, wait a minute, I've spent a lot of time in China, and they have all these classes and online systems that are in language. Why can't we figure out bridging that gap? We ended up putting together a digital skills in Mandarin, Ken and Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese. And so these elders who spoke limited English, all of a sudden, the light bulb came on. Now, that said, we had to really modify those classes. I mean, that, that module that was an hour long was like a semester for, that, for the elders. So we had to break it into more meaningful bites. But I'll tell you, seeing the look on their faces um, when one said, hey, for the first time I was able to upload or download my ORCA card, which is their, their public transit card. That may seem simple to them, but it was a gigantic accomplishment for that elder. Um, I, and then the other piece that sort of turned out to be, um, uh, that needed to be looked at was, um, Google said, hey, we usually have 20 kids in a class. We said, we think six is the right number. And they said, no, 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 that's never gonna work. And so we compromised, and we did 12. And, and our, and, and our Mandarin-speaking young John Hopkins graduate was in there with 12 elders who had never turned on a computer, didn't know what a mouse was. And she was completely overwhelmed mm. because they, <laughs> it just it wouldn't work. We ended up, we ended up recruiting um, student volunteers and added tutors to those classes and created a ratio of two or three to one for that bridge. Now, I, I'm not saying that you can do it, but you can't take the off-the-shelf stuff. And you've got to customize it to that elder, customize it to their education level, to their, um, their comfort with, 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 with digital stuff. Um, and, um, and, and, and so it's successful. So all I would say is there's an opportunity there, but there's a lot of challenge there as well. Well, that's not all you would say, but certainly uh, <laughs> <laughs> Louise, real quick. Um, how can we, to me, it's like, how can we talk about AI when you have 31 million Latinos that are deficient in digital yeah. skills, yeah. how can we talk about AI when 35% of Latino families don't have internet access? How can you talk about AI when 63% of adults don't own a computer, Latino adults? And so we need to, there's a huge equity gap here now. So to me, that's, so AI can become really scary for our community. However, we have to embrace it because if not, we're gonna continue to be left behind now We've been big on like it has to be regulated. However, pros of AI that we're excited. I think AI can be utilized to um, train, right? Like to upskill individuals um, in really amazing, great ways. And I also think AI can be utilized to make our work at the provision service more efficient. We can become more efficient at analyzing data. We can become more efficient at giving solutions to our um, to our clients. And so. It could be leveraged for good. We need to regulate it, and, but we also need to address the huge disparities that exist in the community. I have more questions, but uh, I think I'm going to stop here so that we can stay on time. But I, I want to thank uh, my panel, and please give them a hand. Again, we have Tracy Scott, Luis Quinones, Larry Curley, Clayton Fong. Again, thank you so much for talking to us, sharing your expertise, and I hope that you are, because every time I participate in this, I'm always so much smarter than I was when I woke up this morning, and I hope that you are too. And so we are gonna move forward again. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.